As we grow in your word this morning, help Pastor Todd to clearly communicate this example of Abraham and his desire to obey and follow you. And as we go, enable us to trust and be led by you. God, this morning, be honored and glorified in all that is said and done here. And it's in the name of Jesus, your Son, and the Lamb of God that you provided for us that we pray this now. Amen. Before you are seated, take a minute to greet someone around you. For six months into a replant, some of you are new here, I see just today, we, we uh, became Waynesville Community Church uh, right after the first of the year. We're six months into me being here, it's starting the seventh month, and uh, we're glad that you have come to worship with us. We are about God's glory. We believe that making much of Him is better than making much of ourselves. So we are traveling through the Bible and we'll just pretend Jack's not here. Well, we're traveling through the Bible. He's going to make it work. And uh, we're 18 months in the Old Testament. We're 18 months in the New Testament looking at the gospel, how the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we're in Genesis, which means the beginning. Tomorrow, Lord willing, if he gives it to us, about 600 to 800 people will be here for the harvest party. So if you still want to help, you can join in, sign on your connection card right in front of you. Uh, there'll be games, food, hot dogs, uh, uh, gifts given away, a lot of candy for the kids to go crazy on. And then we send them all home, so they go home. But the main thing, we want to assimilate people into the life of the church and into Christ. We want them to be here in Christ eventually. That is an outreach for us, so thank you. Many of you cooking food, you're preparing, you've set up the building, you'll take down, you'll put stuff up. There's people watching the kids today, the kids' room is full. There's people ministering to the youth in the youth loft. There's so many people it takes to have this ministry work well. I just want to say very much thank you. One real quick thing, if you take your worship guide and open it up, just to remind you, the reading plan is right on the inside. That's the most important thing that we do is getting people in his word so you can see each week where to be reading through Genesis and to be prepared. Great things can happen at your dinner table. There's growing deeper questions. Just pick one of them and ask your kids, your students. Just pick one of them and go over them together as you pray with somebody or your group and just ask the Lord, say, take us deeper. Sometimes you have to drop the rake and pick up the shovel. Not just a glance through, right? To get alone with the Lord and say, speak to me and dig a little bit into a commentary or into your Bible notes, but he'll speak to you. So that's what we're doing here. Today, we're talking about testing. And when we get tested, it reveals who we really are. A test can shape us. It can mature us. We're going to talk about that. But the Bible says, Jesus said, it reveals more than anything. It reveals where we are. When I was in ninth grade, I, we were asked to take an algebra test all of a sudden, and the teacher had a suspicion that several of us were copying each other's notes. And so he came in one day, and he spread us out, and we took an algebra test, which I'm proud to say I did make a 60. I almost passed. <laughs> It was not my best class. 
So uh, he said to some of us, you're not what you thought you were. You're not math geniuses. Well, that's what a test does. It reveals where we really are. Sometimes it confirms and we say, boy, I'm glad the Lord has really grown me. And sometimes it reveals some things we've got ways to grow. If you, again, if you read anything other than the scriptures, I hope you'll read biographies or autobiographies. And one person I would recommend is Adoniram Judson. So Adoniram Judson went to Burma. He spent 40 years there. If I remember, he buried three wives, multiple kids buried them. In, he was born in the late 1700s. He was a part of a missionary movement that went to the world, that saw millions of people come to Christ, and put the gospel in India and China and part of the reason why the underground church there is so explosive is people like Adonaim who went and preached the gospel. Many of them went years and years and years before they saw one person come to Christ. They planted and planted and planted. So he writes to his future father-in-law. He asks for the hand of her daughter. Her name was uh, Hasseltine. And he asks for her hand, and he says this. Here's what he says. I have now come to ask you whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. We're going on the mission field. We're not, we're not coming back. We're going to die there. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to hardships and sufferings of a missionary life whether you can consent to her exposure of the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, even humiliation. She will experience insult and persecution and perhaps and most likely a violent death. Can you consent to all this for your daughter, for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and who died for you and who died for the sake of the perishing immortal souls and who died for the sake of the glory of God, can you consent to all this in hope that you will soon meet your daughter in a world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by praise which will resound to her Savior from all the people who get saved? What a test. Open the letter. Your daughter's probably going to die. You'll never see her again. Does the gospel mean that much to you? What a test. Abraham, he's got many gods. He's polytheistic. God calls him to himself. He says, leave you all your other gods. Leave your home. Leave your family. Walk with me. He goes a thousand miles, as we talked about last week. He doesn't know where he's going. Taking one step or another. And God says to him, I'll show you where are you to go? And it, you don't need to know anything else. So he starts walking. A famine hits. He goes down into Egypt. He gets scared. Sarah's his half-sister, but he asks her to lie and say to Pharaoh, you're my sister. Don't tell him, don't tell him you're married. Pharaoh takes her in. Can you again imagine him lying awake at night thinking, I just sold my wife off to another man? He falters Big time. And in this famine, God tests him again because he frees up Sarah, tells Pharaoh, leave her alone, that's my daughter, gives her back to him, and here's how he tests him. He makes him extremely rich. You say, well, what kind of test is that? He says, it's grace. Abraham says, I don't deserve this. And God says, no, you don't. You never deserved it. And he graces him and expands his territory and his life and sends him out. He says, don't do this again. But Abraham does it again. So on this journey, he gets tested over and over. Sometimes he falls. Sometimes he raises to the occasion. But he learns more each time about himself. 
So at 99 years of age, God comes to him and says, I want you to be circumcised and circumcise all the men in your camp. That's another test. So he goes to them, says, we're to be circumcised. God is marking us off from the rest of the world that the most intimate way our heart and our body belongs to God. So they, they get circumcised. Then he's asked to remove Ishmael, his son. Remember, Sarah said, if you'll have sex with my maidservant so I can have a child, I'll be okay with it. He goes, have sex with the maidservant, has a child. She says, guess what? I'm not okay with that. And he, she says, I don't want him in the camp. And she drives him away. This is going to be a test that's going to prepare him for this big test. And he removes Ishmael from the camp. And God says, I'll take care of him. And now he's walking with God about 75 years. And God comes to him and says, give up the son you love. He said, how, do you, how, how would you treat your son and daughter that way? Abraham is faithful. He loves the Lord. Well, it's a test. It's not a temptation. In the Bible, test and temptation are the same word. Same word. It depends on motive. So if Satan gives you an offer, it is to bring you down. If God gives you an offer, it is to raise you up. One's a temptation to fall. One's a test to grow up. So same word, uh, different motives. Now, remember he told Abraham, I blessed you for one reason. Anybody remember? To be a blessing to the nations. All the nations are going to be blessed by you. Now, how's that going to happen? There's no way, except God does bigger and better things than you could ever think or imagine. So first of all, on your screen, number one, God asked for a sacrifice, or you could say called. He called for a sacrifice to test his servant. So again, he tests him. He doesn't tempt him. Now, we get the advantage where we're way back here, we're looking there. We know it's not going to take place, but he doesn't know. We actually know that Deuteronomy, Exodus, all the way through Scripture, God forbids this kind of sacrifice. He says it is an abhorrent thing to sacrifice your children. And he tells Israel, go to the other nations and preach the gospel to them, so that they might turn from their wicked ways. And one of the things he mentions, they even sacrifice their kids. So Psalm 106, Psalm 106, he sums it up. They sacrifice their sons and their daughters to the, say it. Here's, here's what's important. You jump ahead to the New Testament, ties this verse in. Paul says, false teaching is from demonic spirits. It is a spirit that speaks to a leader that starts a cult or a false religion that says Jesus Christ is not sufficient, he's not God, he didn't pay for your sins, he didn't raise from the dead, or that he did those things but you need something else. So we know God is commanding something he is not going to allow. Sometimes he commands something that he forbids for a period of time and it almost always is to test his servants. Abraham came out of this false religion where his gods would have called him to do this. So he's now learning about God. He's been walking with God. He gets this call. And all he knows is, is that God is good. And he believes that God's going to keep his promise. So he starts out. 22.1. Look, look at your Bible. 22.1. After these things, God tested Abraham. And Abraham said to him, do you see it in the Bible? What's the next three words? Here I am. Your servant's listening. He has learned to be sensitive to the voice of God. That's why we are a spirit and word church. We need the Holy Spirit in the word, in the family of God, to grow us up and be his people. So he says, he says, here I am. In chapter 21, after these things, tells us that he had planted a tree and he had called God the everlasting God. He had just celebrated God. And he celebrated him in such a way that he builds this place, this monument of a tree. And he says, I want you to know, and he tells everybody, my God is the everlasting God. El Olam. 
El Olam. My God knows front and back. He knows the eternity, and he's in the front, and he's right here. He's the everlasting God. He's, he's always with me. He was in my past. He's in my future. He's in my present. He's the everlasting God. Now, the word test means to prove the quality of. So, he is being proved. Abraham is being proved not to God. He's being proved to the people around him that he said, I quit following all the other gods and I'm following the true God and now they're watching him and he's going to be proved in front of them. Everybody understand that? Say amen. God does not need to know what's in his heart. They need to know. Well, you had this God, Abraham, before. I mean, you had that God and you had these gods and you were burning these sacrifices and you were doing this and you were wearing these clothes and you were saying this and now you say this God's the God. He needs to show by his walk and his talk that he has been transformed by the real true God. So, verse 2, Take your son, your only son whom you love, go to the land of Moriah, offer him as a burnt offering the mountains, which I shall tell you. If you write in your Bible, just write Jesus Christ. This is is the beginning. The The New Testament says the Old Testament is a shadow of the real thing. It's a shadow. You see a person, you see a shadow, you kind of know a little bit about them. It's a shadow of the real thing. So the only son the father sent to earth, Jesus, is pictured here, and he will become the offering. Moriah means the land of bitterness. He will be offered in bitterness, forsaken by the father, and be offered up on the mountain. By the way, Moriah is Jerusalem, will later be called Jerusalem, the place of peace, He will be the offering of peace, and he will come later. Now, think with me about real life and real people. You got got a woman that says, have sex with my maidservant. That happens. She's upset and hurt. Get rid of the son. All of that's painful. So he has Ishmael first removed. Sarah's living with the pain of her decision, what she said. This boy reminds her of that. All of that's so painful, all the way around. That test was preparing him for this test. Every test we've ever had is preparing us for another preparation of somewhere of season of our life. So when this big test comes, give the one away you really love. He's been through it to some degree, and he's better prepared. So verse 3 You see how Abraham is towards God? He rose up early in the morning. He took his son Isaac. He he took the wood. Uh, Isaac is called a lad in the Hebrew, so he's a teenager, probably 13, 14 years old. He's not a little boy. He's carrying the wood. He's not a grown man yet, so 13, 14, 15. He's carrying the wood, and verse 4 says, it's on the third day they see the place. So they have three days to walk and talk and share and think and pray and meditate on God's promises. It's not an immediate thing. It's three days of pondering. How is God going to raise this son up from the dead? Because God told me it would be this son that blesses all the nations. How is he going to be blessing all the nations if I put him to death? So they're talking. They're praying. They're thinking. Thankfully, he has three days. 1988, we take our youngest daughter, Jacqueline, to Children's Hospital, the one who just had the twins. By the way, the names are Banks and Willa. Banks and Willa. We take our little girl to the Children's Hospital. They tell us, uh, this is bad. One of the believers there said, you need to pray Ask people to pray. So we got three days of waiting. Doctor says, about 50-50, I want to be honest with you. But she's, he says, she's bad. She's only two, three months old. They're pouring antibiotics into her. Got stuff on her machinery. We're sitting outside in the hallway. Glenn and I are sitting out in the hallway. A lady comes and sits beside of us. Don't know her from Eve. Don't know who she is regular clothes she don't know that she worked at the hospital don't know anything about her 
we got tears in her eyes. She comes up and she smiles and she says, I want you to know your baby's going to be okay. Today, 88, so that's a long time ago. I'd count it in my head, but I didn't do good in algebra, as I said, but in 98, 2008, 2018, 34 years ago, something like that. I, we don't know if she's an angel. We don't know if she was an angel or not. We don't know. She walks around the corner. I decide to go after her. Can't find her. Maybe she went into a room. I don't know. But we looked at each other and we said, we've got to believe God's promises. That was the longest three days of my life. Some of you were on the other side. You didn't get to take her home or him home. That means a lot. On the third day, they got there. Verse 5. So Abraham said to his young men with him, who came with him and his son, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy are going to go over there, and we're going to worship. We're going to declare God's worth, and we are going to come back to you. I don't know how. I don't know when, but he's going to come back, and he's going to raise up, and we, not me, we are coming back to you because God promised. We're coming back. He's been on his face. He has built altars to God. In his, even in his faltering, he has worshipped. By the way, worship comes from the word worthy. He declared God worthy. Even in the test, even in the pain, he said, you're still worthy. We're coming back. Here's what testing does. First of all, if you'll write this in, testing confirms It confirms, if you write that in, and matures our faith. So right now, Abraham's faith is being confirmed in the same way with us. When you're tested, it is confirming for somebody around you to see that you have real faith. Here, if you put it this way, just put it this way. Somebody's going to learn that you don't just love God's blessings, you actually love God more than the blessings. When the blessings are gone, sight going, health going, body going, mind going, stuff gone, when it's gone or going, people wonder, do you still love him as much? Because most people are going to look at us and they're, they're questioning. Well, they'll say things like, well, of course you love him. You're in America. You got cars and running water. You got stuff. Of course you love him. Well, now it is being confirmed to people around him that he loves God more than the blessings. That's what's being confirmed. Verse 1, Abraham, come. He said, here I am. It is interesting. This is at the, this is at the point he is at the richest of his life. He's, one of the, he's the, probably the richest man on earth. He is being tested do you still love me even if you lose stuff, like, like a son or a loved one? James 2, you know this, it talks, about, it talks about Abraham. It says, Abraham believed and was counted righteous. He was made righteous with God by faith, not by works, not by doing something. He, Josie said that, I, I didn't perform for God. I came to surrender to God. You see, it's plural, all of you who are around him see, you people, all of you see, that a person is justified, here the word changes, to proved righteous. We're justified, declared righteous with God by faith, but we're justified in front of people, proved righteous by our, say it out loud, works, transformation, transformation. You are justified by the transformation of your life, the way you serve, love people, greet people, live joyfully, forgive people, honor people, serve people, though it costs you, give generously, financially. You are proved righteous by your works and not by faith alone. So James goes on before this and after. He says, what good does it do if you say you have faith, but no one can see it? In other words, we say your walk must match your 
talk. Everybody knows that. If people have to believe what we say or what we do, they'll always believe what we do. They'll say things like, well, he says he is a Christian, but I don't know, he's pretty darn hard on people. He's rough. Man, he'll chew you out in a second. She'll criticize the heck out of you if you, if you could. <laughs> you better not make him mad. You just watch her the way she, they, they'll, they'll talk about her actions. So, so Abraham is being confirmed in front of other people. So we did a funeral this weekend, Barb Buckland, very special lady. You, you want to know how special it is? She had three pastors up here on the stage, three, three. And we didn't even charge anything. And so we wanted her. So over and over and over, I listened to you and her family Here's how she loved her children. Here's how she loved her grandchildren. Here's how she loved her great-grandchildren. Here's how she served in hospitality ministry. Here's how she, over and over and over, transformation, 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 transformation. Abraham is being proved in front of some people who needs it. So you notice what Abraham does not say? He does not say, why me? Never says it. He knows there's a bigger picture than him. Second, testing confronts, if you'll write the word in, confronts our deepest desires. A test confronts what we really affectionately love and long for and want down deep. Sometimes we're not even sure till the test comes along. In verse 2, I want you to give up the son you love. Fast forward several thousand years, Jesus said, if you love, if you love your son, your daughter, your mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. So the son you love, give him up. Give, give him up. So Abraham's deepest desires are tested. They're tested in front of people who have seen him dote on this son. They've seen him lavish blessings on this son. Third, testing creates for us a greater dependence. If you just write that in, creates, it creates greater dependence. So Josie just spoke about it, 38 years old in the hospital, she doesn't come out saying, wow, I realized how amazing I am. She comes out saying, I can't do this, but you can, and I abide in you, and you abide in me. I'm not, but you are, and I abide in you, and you abide in me. I don't even want to at times, but you want to, and I abide in you, and you abide in me. So there's a greater dependence now in Abraham. And one of the things about testing is the abruptness of it. You remember where we started after these things? He's going along, going along, doing well, walking with the Lord, doing well. And then like a brick wall falls on him. Brick wall. <laughs> Give up your son. It's the abruptness of a doctor saying, this doesn't look good. A phone call at two o'clock in the morning. A boss that you thought you had a career with, and he says, we don't need you anymore. It's the abruptness of it. He gets up in the morning after all these things. He just planted a tree. Before that, he's celebrating God. God says, here it is. Now, he goes to Moriah. If you want to write this down, somewhere on your sheet, Moriah originally meant bitterness, but it came to mean the Lord provides. So it, it was the place of bitterness where the Lord provides. You see what's happening? You go to the place of bitterness, and I'll provide for you there. It's in the bitterness that I'll be more real to you than ever. Karen Watson, she's on your screen. You may not know her, but she was asked by people not to sign up in the military, not to go to Iraq, and she said, it's my calling to go serve people there with the gospel. And so she goes to Iraq, and unfortunately, she dies. So they read a letter, 
at her funeral, and here's what it says. You're opening this letter in the event of my death. When God calls, I want you to know there are no regrets. I share my heart with you as much as possible and my heart for the nations. I wasn't ever called to really a specific place. I was called to him. She, uh, in another time, said, like Abraham, she said, I didn't know where I was actually going. He, he just said, go. I didn't know where I was going. To obey him was my only objective, and to suffer was expected. His glory was my reward. His glory be my reward. I want you to care more than some think is wise. I want you to risk more than some will tell you is safe. Dream more than some think is practical and expect more from God than some will tell you is possible. I would remind you, I was not called to comfort or success. I was called to follow Christ. People said, what a waste. She had so much ahead of her. She said, no, it wasn't a waste. He called me. He grew me. Second, God provides a substitute sacrifice. So he asks for a sacrifice, and then the text turns to God provides the sacrifice, and the Lord is going to give the sacrifice to Abraham. Now, when we talk about substitute, we usually talk about it in a negative way, right, or a different way, like a substitute teacher. Every, every student likes a substitute teacher once in a while because it's a free day or close to it. And we talk about the second stringers coming in, right? The substitutes are coming in, and the first string of the other team is going to run right through them. But that's not the way substitute is mentioned here. It's meant that someone pushes you aside and says, I'll take your place. You can't do what I'm doing. You can never do it. So we know he's not going to kill this boy because it would do no good. It wouldn't be a substitute. It would be a waste. He cannot fulfill what God can do. So he comes in, God comes in and provides a substitute. So verse 6, he's got the wood and he lays it on Isaac. You see Christ is all over this passage. He weighs the, lays the wood on him. He, he's got the knife. Uh, the word slaughter means he'll cut his throat like a lamb. They go together, verse 7. Isaac says, my father, he says, here I am. Where's the lamb? Verse 8 is the key phrase. God said, God will provide for himself. He didn't say God will provide. God will provide for himself the lamb. In other words, we could not provide the right sacrifice. All I know is God will provide for himself. So we know verse 11 on, an angel comes and God sends angels at times. They are worshiping and obedient and messengers and an angel comes and he says, Abraham, Abraham, he gets his attention. Abraham says, here I am. He says it again. On both ends, Abraham said, here I am. When he did not know what it would cost him, when he knew what it would cost him, he said, here I am. Here I am. I see that you fear me. Verse 13, so Abraham lifts up his eyes and he looks and there was a ram caught in the thicket. It's what uh, theologians call concurrence. God is working in different ways. He's called one thing to happen, but he's working in a whole bunch of different ways. So Abraham's walking with his son up one side of the mountain. There's a, there's a ram on the other side of the mountain. Do you see him? Eating grass, eating grass, eating grass, playing around, maybe chasing other lambs, rams, whatever. And he sees something, goes in the thicket. He goes after it. He gets stuck there. They know nothing about the ram. They get to the place and they meet. 
You know, that's why God is called the everlasting God. He's bringing up the ram on the other side when Abraham doesn't even know. And there it is. It's stuck there. Sometimes you have to believe in future grace when you don't see it being very gracious. Like a little boy standing on a pool, a little girl standing on a pool, first time she jumps in, and you're in the pool, you got your hands there, and they have to believe in future grace. They got to believe that when that second or two that they're flying through the air, that they're going to be okay because you got them. And they, they get there, right? They get there, and they, they, they kind of, you know, kind of go, and they, are, are you going to catch me? I, I got you. you you're going to catch me? No belly flops? No belly flops. And he, they jump off, and if two seconds, and you got them. That's all Abraham knows. I just know he's got me. I just know he's got me. Isaiah 53, 7. We're going to read this. So this was written 700 years before Christ. It is the only book, we have the whole book from the past. This scroll, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, is dated a hundred years before Christ was born. So people used to say, Isaiah's too perfect, it had to be written after Christ came. Well, now we know that's not true. A hundred years before Christ was born, Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them are earlier than that. The only book, we have the whole book, Isaiah, 700 years before he came, before the cross was ever invented. About 300 years before the cross was invented. You ready? Let's read it. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Same words here. It's going to be slaughtered. Christ Jesus led like a lamb to the slaughter. So who's Isaiah talking about? He's talking about Christ. What else will happen with him? Next verse. Ready? You read it? After his soul is made a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He'll die and then he'll see. He'll die, and then he'll see everyone he died for. Let me say that one more time, just so you didn't hear me. He will die, and then he'll see everyone he died for. 700 years before Christ came, Isaiah saying, there's one who will come, who is the Lamb, who will be the definite article, guilt offering on your behalf, and he will rise up, and he will see everyone he dies for. That's the gospel. That is what Abraham believed. Why did he offer up his son? Because he believed in the God of resurrection. It's the only way you could do it. He will offer up himself as a gift offering and he will see his people. Third, God calls us to trust his provision. So you say, what's my response today? Same for Abraham. Trust the provision, the sufficiency. If you got your Bible, 2214, Abraham names a place now that comes synonymous with God. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. He is sufficient. He will provide. So, Abraham's mentioned multiple times in the New Testament, but he's mentioned in Hebrews 11, which is the hall of faith, not the hall of fame. You read Abraham, you read read Hebrews 11, and here's what you come away with. God loves losers. David, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, big-time losers. Adultery, selling off your wife denying God, rejecting the Lord at times. God doesn't just love winners. He loves losers who come to him and say, I've got nothing but surrender. So here's what it says about Abraham as we close. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, not tempted, I'm going to prove your life faith in front of people, He offered up Isaac. Here's the rest of it. He considered, I think this is the three days he's walking 
It means think through, ponder, meditate on. He meditated on the fact that God is able even to raise him from the dead. You're starting to see the nuggets of the New Testament and the Old Testament. It goes together. You're starting to see the gospel. The gospel is nothing unless Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Nothing. We're no better than Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, anybody else you name. We're no better, no different. You just try to be moral, good people. Don't drink coffee. Do this. Wear these clothes. Go this place. Do these five things. Do the eightfold will. Do these twelve. We're no different. We're just going to come here and say, hey, do your best this week. Come on. Get it, get it going. Put it in gear. Do your best. That's the way I was raised. It is a dead life. I need somebody who will do their best for me that I can't do. God never says, go be a champion. Go do your best. No, he says, I sent my favorite, best son. I'm going to have many sons and daughters, but I sent the Son of God, God who became man, who lived righteously to exchange your unrighteousness. When you come to him, he says, I give you my righteousness for your unrighteousness. And he died on the cross. He said, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to put you to death yet. I'll separate you from me forever if I need to, but I'm not putting you to death because my son died for you. And when he rose again, he didn't say, go do your best. No, he said, believe in the resurrection and have life. That is the text. All Abraham knew is that one is coming. I got to keep my eyes on him. We know something he didn't know. He came. He came. And we know he's coming. Just to remind you, no one will miss it. The sky will be ripped open like the curtain was in the temple from the top to the bottom. It will be ripped open and every eye will see him. And some will say, hide me under the mountains. So what the it's what the gospel says. Hide me from him. And some will say, I have been waiting on you. I have been waiting on you. But there's no in between. Nobody will walk around yawning. Nobody will walk around and say, eh, it's no big deal. You will either want to hide or you will say, I been waiting on you. Which are you? That's what the text, which are you? No in between. Father, thank you that many people in this room have put their faith in you. I'm just going to sing one chorus and worship you, and then we're going to go prepare for the harvest party. We're going to set up things, we're going to get things ready. Because we want a whole lot of people in Waynesville and the world to be able to be people who say they love you and they're ready for you to return.